Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Reverend Joe Paparone. So grateful to be with you here this morning to gather and worship and reflection and centering. If you are a guest this morning, good news, I am too. And so if anything seems awkward or strange or like we don't know what we're doing, it's probably just me, but it's also definitely not you. Nothing, you're not confused about anything. It's, it's almost certainly me on my part up here. But we're so glad you're here. We are gathered this morning as the church to worship, to reflect, to center ourselves on the spirit and movement of God in the world, and to steel ourselves, strengthen ourselves collectively to go out and be the church in the world for the rest of the week. So I'm so grateful for you to be here, and I'm glad to join with you. Um, there are a number of announcements, but because I'm a guest, I don't have all the details on them. You have all the details of them. <laughs> Please take a look uh, in your bulletin and, and take a look at all those announcements. There's plenty going on. Um, I know we're just starting the summer, and so that's that's a wonderful time. I know it's a little a little gloomy and dreary today, but it'll be it'll be nice soon. Um, also, want to invite Ali up to make an announcement. going to pray a bit this morning together, um, but I, I was given a, a particular prayer request that I'd like to just lift up first thing before we get started for the family of Eric and Mary Lou Jacobson on the passing of Mary Lou's mother. She was 103, and so we lift up our hearts in mourning, in collective care for our family and community, but also in a celebration that her mother has now joined the communion of saints, the great cloud of witnesses. Tomorrow is Juneteenth, and that's a, a, a new holiday for a lot of us, or relatively new for a lot of us, and it commemorates the announcement in Texas in 1865 of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, it was not, sometimes people get a little confused about it, it was not the official ending of slavery, uh, that was actually a complex process. The Emancipation Proclamation had been issued a few years before, um, but in the aftermath of the Civil War, this was the final proclamation given uh, basically in the, in the southernmost reaches of our country. Now, we live in upstate New York, and sometimes that history and story feels really far away. Uh, however, we also live in a place that was, at the time, a hotbed of the Underground Railroad, and I encourage you, on Juneteenth, if you get some time off, or if you're, if you're thinking about what's going on, especially tomorrow, to look into it a little bit. Learn a little bit about the vigilance committees that organized, that were often rooted in communities of faith, fighting against this scourge of chattel slavery. Learn about the emancipation of Charles Nolley by Harriet Tubman and 2,000 members of Troy, the city of Troy. Uh, a fascinating history that I'm constantly learning and discovering, and it all took place just around here, in our area, as well as the broader area of the state New York. So with that, let's lift our hearts together in worship.
rise as you are able for the call to worship. Come and worship. Welcome, you are called as disciples of Christ. Is anything too wonderful for our God? Nothing is too wonderful for God who gave us and called us. We remember the goodness of God who promised Abraham a multitude of descendants and then showed up at Abraham's door to announce that the promise would be fulfilled. of Jesus who noticed this, this distress of his neighbors and acted to bring them healing and wholeness. We remember the invitation the Spirit extends to us to join in God's work of compassionate community building.
has done it. God has carried away our foolishness. God has brought us out of despair and given us hope and made us God's precious treasure. He gives thanks to our God, whose love is fresh and new, and in every moment, his faithfulness is forever. Let us join in the Lord's Prayer as printed in the bulletin. God, lover of all, set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is where, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you. Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set them all and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So ends this reading of the Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. children.
shape. Yeah. Yeah, they would have the same shape. Because they were made out of the same cocoa. Very good. So you, you, do you think I used the cookie cutter to make these cookies? Yes. Yes, I, right, I did. So now take a look at your friends around you and my children in the rows over here. take a moment, I'd like to invite the ushers forward to collect our offerings. I was part of a church for a long time where we said, everything belongs to God, we are only the caretakers. And that's an important way that we ground ourselves in understanding what it is we're doing when we collect offerings together collectively as a church to advance the work of the church. So, give with joyful, generous hearts. Pastures green. 
Almighty God, with your powerful arms, hold up your church. Struggling through tough times in our churches, we need to be renewed and filled with your power. As you revive the saints who came before us, revive us to go out and welcome the forgotten, heal the sick, speak the words of comfort and hope to the discouraged. In the holy name of Christ, we pray. Join in your hymnals four fifty four. Ever faithful Lord, ever giving Son, ever present Spirit, for the many gifts you grant us and the opportunity to enjoy these things, for your daily provision and for the constant signs of your healing love, for the hope amidst despair and the light which always shines, for all these things. Thank you. It's just so inadequate, but it's all we have to show our gratitude in word, in thought, and in action. Ever faithful Lord, ever giving Son, ever present Spirit, yeah. hear our prayer. So thank you, Lord, and may our thanks move beyond words to transform us into thankful folks, faithful folks, attentive folks, folks who notice need and notice the need to act, folks who love to live and live to love, folks who serve you by serving others. Ever faithful Lord, ever giving Son, ever present Spirit. Help us to be amongst those who include the excluded and bring in those who are marginalized. That when the opportunities come our way to be healers of division and hurt, to be peacemakers and restorers, we won't be found wanting. Ever faithful Lord, ever giving Son, ever present Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we bring before you those people and issues that are closest to us and that occupy our minds at this time. Ever 
faithful Lord, ever-giving Son, ever-present Spirit, hear our prayer. Transforming, healing creator, help us to make the light shine in dark places, to make peace known in violent places, and to bring hope to despondent places. Our prayers, spoken and silent, are brought to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus, the healer, includer, and redeemer forever. Please stand, if you're able, for the Gospel reading. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 26, which can be found on page 9 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection station, and he said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. And as he sat at a dinner in the house, Many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The wedding attendants cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins, otherwise the skins burst, the wine is spilled, and the skins are ruined. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader came in, and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly, a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that moment. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw all the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread through all of that district. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks. I know I introduced myself at the very beginning of our service, but once again, I just want to say thank you so much for everyone who's been welcoming me here as your guest minister this morning. My name is the Reverend Joe Paparone. I'm the lead organizer of a group called the Labor Religion Coalition of New York State. We organize faith communities across our state, labor unions across our state, and community groups for social, racial, and economic justice. And so what that looks like, mostly for me, is organizing and supporting the New York State Poor People's Campaign. And that's a part of a broader national movement, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which is a continuation of Dr. King's last campaign. Uh, if you were here when I last visited, back in March, I remember I talked a little bit more in depth about it then, and I'm happy to chat more about that after the service. Um, many of you also joined us for a conversation after the service in March around medical debt and um, the, the need for universal health care in our state and in our country. And um, if you've been paying attention, that need continues to be in the news. Even this past week, we learned that the Burdett Birth Center over in Troy is going to be 
and is scheduled, slated at the moment to be closed in four to six months. That is the only maternity center in Rensselaer County. Um, there is still time to push back on this, uh, but I hope you're paying attention and then seeing what happens when healthcare is privatized and held in the hands in ways to generate profit rather than generate health for the community. And that's actually not the entirety of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so we'll get into it. I wanna jump into the sermon reflecting on this gospel passage. Who is the gospel for? The word gospel means good news. And so who specifically is this good news for? So the Gospel of John has its famous passage, For God so loved the world. In the beginning of Luke's Gospel, in the Christmas story, the angels appear to the shepherds and they announce good news of great joy for all the people. But then a little later on in Luke, when Jesus gives his first sermon, he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus is quoting the prophets all the time. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This is interesting. This specificity is important because the first hearers of these words, the first readers of these texts, and all the way through history to today, we all live in a hugely unequal world in terms of wealth and power and access to the things that people need to survive. And this inequality that existed in their world and in ours, it doesn't just happen. It's not an accident. The scriptures from start to finish are filled with rules and laws and instructions about how to treat one another fairly, how to treat other people justly, not just on an individual basis, but structurally, as a society, to make sure that people aren't exploited or made to be poor. These instructions are more than just be nice to each other at an individual level, although that's important. They involve a whole redistribution of power and wealth in society. The scriptures are often speaking into a world of inequality and injustice and against that inequality and injustice. It doesn't just happen. You can make a good case from reading much of the Bible that the authors understood the inequality of society to be a problem that can be addressed, something that could be changed. Keep in mind, we are propagandized. There is a whole narrative stream in our world trying to convince us that fundamentally things cannot change. Sure, we can work to make things a little bit better here and there, but that actually ending poverty, actually ending this horrific inequality, actually ending the nightmare of lack of health care for people, right? People want us to think that that's impossible. And that's always been the case. But the scriptures tell a different story. The scriptures call us to understand and believe and trust that in fact, yes, the world can be changed. It doesn't need to be this way. So I think one of the points of our passage in Matthew today is that this gospel of Jesus for it to be truly good news for everyone is going to look different for different people based on their location and position in society. The good news isn't just a flat thing that everybody gets in exactly the same way. And so our passage today is a series of interactions that help clarify who the good news is for and further how it is good news for the, the people in society who don't have very much good news in their lives. And the crux of it all is this quote that Jesus uses from the prophets, where he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now there's a lot of different pieces in our gospel passage today, so I want to look at all the players. First we have Matthew, a tax collector. And while we don't get a ton of detail about tax collectors in the gospels, they are generally grouped with sinners, people who've done something wrong. Tax collectors at this time were not simply bureaucrats who were checking your paperwork at the IRS. They were sellouts to the Roman Empire, the Roman occupying forces. They were betrayers of their people. They were working for the enemy. They were collecting exorbitant taxes and then often skimming off the top as well. Now, we don't know much about Matthew from this interaction, but we can gather that the people who were following Jesus would have been extremely suspicious of him. And yet, when Jesus calls him, he finds something compelling, so compelling about Jesus that he immediately gets up 
and leaves the work behind. We have these other unspecified sinners that Jesus eats a meal with. And this passage doesn't say, but we know when we read the rest of the Gospels, who are the kinds of people that Jesus spends his time with? Who are the kinds of people who actively seek him out? Poor people, laborers, ethnic and cultural enemies, those who are outcasts of society, those who are ritually unclean. We have the disciples of John, and here they're actually associated a bit with the Pharisees, and both groups were seeking some kind of authority and prestige through religious purity. They're basically confused as to why Jesus is hanging out with all these sinners and not them. They're the ones who've been doing everything right. Why is the Messiah spending time with those other people over there? We have this unspecified leader, and there's only a few things we can glean from his interactions with Jesus, but there's quite a bit in just those few verses. He treats Jesus with a certain official respect by kneeling before him. He's supplicating himself before Jesus as one would before a ruler. And he's begging for help. Then we have this poor woman with a significant and a long-term bleeding illness. Twelve years she's been suffering. This kind of illness is more than just the physical suffering. It results in her being ritually unclean, unable to participate in temple and religious practices, which were major community practices. It renders her a social outcast, because no one would want to be associated with her for fear of being determined unclean themselves. And then lastly, we have this crowd outside of the deceased girl's home who think they know better than Jesus, they have no confidence or trust in him, and they laugh when he suggests that the girl is only asleep. But back early on in our passage, Jesus said, Go on and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The people in this passage are coming from various social positions. And they have different ideas and perceptions of themselves and in relation to society. Some of them think they are deserving and righteous, like John's followers and the Pharisees, the leader who approaches. Their self-conception is that they're the people who do things right. They maintain the religious purity. They don't hang out with the wrong kind of crowd. Or like the leader, even though he needs something from Jesus, he approaches and makes his request in a formal, very socially acceptable way. The other people in the passage, Matthew the tax collector, the other sinners, the bleeding woman, they approach from a position of marginalization. They're not only people who aren't pure and righteous and correct. They are actively excluded from society. Even Matthew, who likely wasn't in as dire of circumstances as the others, he would have faced severe social isolation. As a tax collector, complicit, collaborating with the Roman forces, he would have been rejected, despised by his own people, and scoffed at, and distrusted and dismissed by the Romans, who were just using him for their own ends. So when Jesus says, I desire, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, it's important to remember that this Gospel of Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. And one of the common ways that this phrase and this passage is understood is as a challenge to a heavily ritualistic piety which John's followers and the Pharisees would have practiced, the ritual sacrifices of the temple system. And really, any religious piety is meaningless if it is not accompanied by mercy and compassion towards those who are suffering and struggling in society. This is a good message. And that's the way this passage is commonly treated. But we want to be careful, because this can easily lead us into a trap of a charity mindset that we simply need to be more compassionate and caring for those less fortunate. Again, that's a good message. I'm not saying that's not important. But there's more going on here. Jesus follows this quote from the prophets, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, with metaphors about patched cloth and new wineskins. He says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away and a worse tear is made. And new wine is not poured into old wineskins, otherwise the skins burst, everything's spilled, it's all wasted, but new wine put into new, fresh wineskins. These are simple metaphors, but they point to a much broader shift. Not simply in our individual attitudes and practices, but a complete reorientation of society. The old cloak cannot accept a patch unless it is prepared correctly. The old containers, the wineskins, cannot accept this new wine of Jesus' teachings. 
Yes, this can be understood as individual change and transformation, but there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is, in a highly unequal society, like Jesus' society, like our society, where there's this small minority of people who have vast amounts of power and wealth at the expense of the vast majority of people, when we say, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, it's more than just the individual religious piety. In this hugely unequal society, from that societal perspective, it is people who are being sacrificed. It is people who are ground down in the service of imperial violence and empire. It is people who are used up and discarded if their labor isn't needed or profitable for corporations. People who are sacrificed amidst the relentless drive for profit that is destroying the planet <coughs> and making it harder for us to breathe. In hugely unequal societies like ours, we have what's called surplus population. And in the past, people might be sent off to colonize and conquer other lands and create profit that way. But now when there are sur surplus populations, we do things like we lock them up. We deny housing and health care and food and cause ma mass death. There's a scholar, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She talks about organized abandonment. It's a process by which communities, both geographic regions, and the people in them have been exploited for profit, and then they are structurally abandoned. They're policed and they're poisoned until a new round of so-called development and profit extraction can then occur. We need to stay awake about this. Not everyone benefits when towns and neighborhoods and cities are revitalized or developed or redeveloped. Our society is structured so that people are sacrificed for the benefit and wealth of a few. Creating a society that is instead structured on mercy is going to require far more than individual compassion and charity, as necessary as those things might be. Mercy, not sacrifice in society, means a complete transformation. New wineskins, Jesus says. <laughs> Dr. King called for a revolution of values at the end of his life, a reorientation at every level. And we see that demonstrated at the end of our passage today. This leader who approaches Jesus, we know very little about him. We don't know what kind of leader he was, what his authority was, whether it came through wealth or descendants or religious piety, or maybe he was simply morally upright and respected in the community. No matter what kind of person he was, he could not save his daughter. And so he comes to Jesus formally, but he's desperate. Whatever he has isn't enough. He needed this new wine that Jesus offers. Of course, Jesus obliges, but on the way there's a scam. The outcast woman, who dared not approach Jesus formally, as the leader does, instead sneaks up <coughs> behind him. She is no less desperate than the leader. Of course, Jesus heals her. And though he's on the way to help the official's daughter, he calls this woman the outcast, the ritually unclean, the woman sacrificed to a society unwilling to show mercy, Jesus calls her daughter. Now this is just speculation, but perhaps it's not too much to think that this other leader who had sought out Jesus' help, it's very possible, likely even, that he had passed by this woman many times over the years and kept his distance. We don't know if this leader understood that interaction between Jesus and the woman and what had changed there. But we can be sure that Matthew, the author of this gospel, wants us to know. The good news of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, as this gospel calls it, is not a place where people like this woman are sacrificed. The good news of Jesus is not simply for those who are important or official or leaders in our viciously cruel society. The good news of Jesus is for her, and it will not simply pass her. Despite all this, there are still people who laugh at Jesus, who continue to laugh today at the mere idea that our society could be different, as I spoke about earlier. It's so obvious to them that the way things are is the way things must be, that the very suggestion of new wineskins is a joke. So they laugh at Jesus, but who gets to laugh? For us, where can we start? There are so many things to do, and it's so overwhelming. And we only have our little piece of the world that we can influence and take part in. But there's something that starts in our passage today that I think gives an indication of where we can begin. 
The passage begins with a meal, a gathering, the unity, the fellowship, the collective education and sharing of stories, the breaking of isolation of the people who are otherwise sacrificed in society. When the poor and dispossessed and outcasts of our society can begin to come together, when every force in society is trying to isolate them, blame them for their own problem, right? Tell us that it's our fault. Well, if you're not, if you're not making enough money to get by, you didn't study hard enough in school. You're not working hard enough, right? These are, these are societal lies in our hugely unequal society. But when the poor and dispossessed can come together and begin to share a meal and talk to one another, that isolation is broken, and suddenly everything else that happens in our passage is precipitated. That's, that gathering is what prompts that confusion in the highly pious and religious followers of John and the Pharisees. That gathering is what prompts this leader, whatever he senses about Jesus, that's where he approaches Jesus. Those who the society would sacrifice must come together, sharing stories of our struggles, building unity and community through the sharing of our resources, and ultimately, by taking action together. It's going to require us to leave behind our old wineskins, the ideas, the habits, the patterns that simply cannot contain this new way and this new society. Join us in a closing hymn. Gracious God, healer of our world, guide us, lead us by your spirit towards this transformation, to creating new wineskins, not only in ourselves, in our hearts, and in our minds, and in our souls, but in the whole of our communities and societies. Guide us by your spirit to go and be the church, bringing together those who would otherwise be left out and sacrificed.